Good evening and welcome to uh, the fourth in a series of webcasts put on by Entheogenesis Australis leading up to the uh, 2021 Garden States event, which tickets will be going on sale for um, shortly. So for tonight's episode, Fungi Foragers will feature fungi experts in a panel discussion about the world of mycology, uh, covering safety, ecology and conservation. We're also going to cover some basic ID tips for the active species of psilocybes. Uh, and um, you would have received, uh, everybody should have received an email uh, with some information on uh, subs on uh, with a link to uh, the guide as well, which you can also get at the Entheogenesis Australis website. Uh, so please uh, head to the website and do download that guide. It's a very comprehensive guide. It's been put together with the assistance of experts um, and uh, I, it's a really helpful resource. Uh, so the first thing we're going to go to tonight is a uh, video uh, with Kane Barlow, uh, just running through uh, some of the different um, species that are found in Australia. Thank you very much for that uh, very helpful guide, Kane. And again, um, if you do want to find out more, entheogenesis.org forward slash resources, and you can download a full guide there that has been prepared uh, with the help of many experts. Um, it's a fantastic guide. Uh, and um, you can download that there and keep that on you at all times. Um, I'm now going to introduce our host for this evening. Uh, our host is Jess Saunders. Jess, welcome. I'll, I'll, and Jess is a botanical illustrator and tattooer living in Northern Rivers in uh, the New South Wales uh, Bundjalung country. A love of the natural world, gardening and science have led her to ongoing involvement in a citizen mycology project, cactus farming, low harm, off-grid living and study of plant tissue culture. You can find her on Instagram at Jess Saunders Tattoo. Jess. Hi, I'm Jess, your panel facilitator for this evening. I'm here with Kane, Emma, Bo, Simon and Darklight, all super invested fungus fanatics. With the current mushroom season already underway, Tonight, we're going to talk about foraging and field trips. From the legalities to field hygiene, safety, conservation, and homegrown science. With an ever-growing Australian mushroom-minded community and not a huge amount known about Australian fungus, there is a lot to think about, be inspired by, and respectful of. Now it's introduction time. Simon, can we start with you? I'm Simon. I've been uh, looking for mushrooms, hunting for mushrooms for about 13 years. I uh, got more into identifying uh, different random species that I've come across in the bush uh, for probably the last 10. Uh, and I've been really lucky to be involved with the Facebook group P-Mans for a couple of years now, um, basically trying to work around harm minimization for psilocybin uh, mushroom hunters and users. Uh, I have a background in medicine and psychiatry. Uh, so really interested in the potential therapeutic applications of psilocybin, uh, which I think are enormous. And I'm really ha uh, happy to see that we're starting to explore that a little bit more now and even in Australia now, which is great to have some of that research done here. Um, one of the projects I've been involved in recently is a survey about people's experience with wood lovers paralysis, which we won't talk about much tonight, but we'll discuss the results of that survey in a couple of months. Um, and yeah, just really love mushrooms. So I'm um, really glad to be here and looking forward to the chat that we're all going to have. Thanks, Simon. Um, how about you, Bo? Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's Bo. Um, some of you might know me from online. Um, I've been interested in fungi for over 20 years. I started in New Zealand um, after I uh, got my qualifications in horticulture while doing horticulture. That's where my interest grew and uh, in the greater bush there. Uh, moved to Australia about 12 years ago, and uh, that interest was something that uh, had followed over, uh, over with me. And so when I moved here, I naturally went out into the bush and started looking for mushrooms. A lot of them weren't described, so I had to uh, learn about them and then learn what they were, uh, which took me many years, uh, and I'm still trying to figure that out now today. Um, yeah, but then uh, since with the mushrooms, I've uh, started up various Facebook groups, uh, Victorian Fungi, um, P-Mans, which is another one which basically focused on psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, and that's more of an identification harm reduction angle. Um, because of my experience, I try and uh, give back to the community. Uh, that taught me so much. 
Um, and then uh, I try and um, uh, give to citizen science as well by trying to find the mushrooms that are out there, taking very good photographs of them and uploading onto um, sites like iNaturalist, which are really important for uh, the people that get paid who study these mushrooms. Uh, they can take that data then and form a, a larger picture. It helps everyone uh, in the process. So that's something that's quite passionate to me. Um, and then I also teach uh, I'm also a fungi educator. So um, I take people out in the bush um, and I teach them how to um, identify mushrooms in a hands-on way. Um, and then I also keep abreast of what's happening in the taxonomy side of things. Um, and I do microscopy and all that sort of other thing uh, as a private hobby. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty much my background. And uh, I'm just here tonight to, um, yeah, to give my 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 uh, expertise and experience. Thanks, Lo. Um, if we can go to dark light now. Hey, uh, I'm dark light, uh, living on Gallable Country up in northern New South Wales, and for the last twenty to twenty five years, I've wrangled various plant biotech micropropagation. Uh, Mycolabs, plant tissue culture mostly, working with medicinal and endangered species. I've uh, just come back from a contract on medical cannabis under ODC auspices. My current project is mutation breeding of medicinal plants, including working on cold tolerant variants of Tabernanthi boga, uh, which has therapeutic use for addiction and possibly for neurodegenerative disorders. But um, on Tuesdays, Jess and I work in the lab on mycology-related projects, including uh, setting up a community mycobank for northern New South Wales funguses, food, medicine, and environmental. Um, we've kind of hit a bit of a standstill there. We've, we've got a few technical issues, but it's certainly something we like to see more of in the wider community. And Jess and Kane and I will be running beginners and intermediate workshops on mushroom cultivation at EGA Garden States in December this year. So we look forward to seeing you there. Beautiful. Thanks heaps, Dark Light. Um, Kane, can you tell us what you've been up to? Hi, Jess. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been up to lots of, lots of different things. Um, so I'm a mycologist. Uh, but I prefer to call myself a fungi educator. I have, I have a real passion for helping communicate knowledge about fungi, uh, how they, what they are, how they grow, and more, and more specifically, how to cultivate them. Um, I have I have a feeling that once you're a forager, you're always a forager. Um, whether it's plants, fungi, rocks, stamps, you know you're. It, it just becomes something that your your eyes are tuned to. Um, and the more that you look, you the more you become attuned to different features. Uh, that, that group of little brown mushrooms that you saw a year ago, this year may be like a Lacarius um, arusula, a Laradiomycetes, or even a Psilocybe. My fungi journey began in the early 90s, foraging for fungi in the forests of far south Tasmania. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information at the time. There was no internet. A lot of the library books, they had pages missing, you know, so trying to work out what you were looking for could, could be problematic. Um, and then, of course, there was the ever-present kind of case of fungal poisonings every year because people were misidentifying fungi. Uh, my friends and I had our own kind of close encounters with some of these species and, um, yeah, you know, it kind of really hit us. It was like, oh, wow, you really need to know the fungi that you're looking for and you really need to know the fungi that you're not looking for. Around 15 years ago, I started getting into mushroom cultivation, uh, growing uh, oysters, shiitake, ganoderma and um, turkey tail. Uh, with the intention of, of getting into try to culture fungi from the wild for conservation purposes. Uh, then in 2009, I quit my job. I started a degree with the intention of, of becoming a professional mycologist. Uh, in 2019, I finished my master's with my thesis being based on conservation mycology. 
uh, a lot of the data that comes from projects like the Atlas of Living Australia and, um, and yeah, and iNaturalist. My current focus is, is fungal education, helping to teach people about fungi and cultivation. I also volunteer with groups like My Community Applied Mycology, the Australian Psychedelic Society, and of course, Entheogenesis Australis, for whom I've created the resource guide with, uh, in partnership with quite a few other people. Uh, and I help, have helped curate the Garden Stage program. I'm also a founder of a group called the Entheome Foundation, who are looking at um, preserving genome data and cultural ethnomycological knowledge uh, for, for preservation for everybody, open source knowledge, essentially. I also write for Third Wave, uh, I write for Double Blind, and I've been teaching as part of Double Blind Mushroom Cultivation course. I also help a lot with sites like the Shroomery uh, and many of the Facebook groups that have been mentioned here, PMANs and, um, and quite a few others. Um, that's, that's pretty much me. I'm pretty much into everything fungal. I'm pretty well myceliated. I'm now just waiting for the Ophiocordyceps fruiting body just to pop out of my head and, and help spread the spores. That's me. <laughs> Thanks, Kane. Good to know you want to end humanity, but um, <laughs> I think we're going to go back to Emma. Um, I don't think her audio is working first time around, so I think we're going to listen to what she's been up to again. Okay, is my audio working this time? I think we should just find out before I do that again. All right, cool. Um, so, yeah, I have a little bit of research and I'm doing some projects in um, micro-materials, so here's what it like, micro-bricks. <laughs> but the main thing I'm interested in is um, ecology and conservation, so I'm just going to share my screen to share a couple of the projects that I've been involved with recently. Um, that's the wrong slide. Uh. <laughs> oh, it's unshared, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the first one is Fungi for Land. Um, this is a book that's currently being written by a whole bunch of mycologists across Australia, and it's the first um, guide to land management with fungi that's probably been bit written at all um, in the world, but definitely the first in Australia. Um, so I think it's going to be a great resource um, for um, both you know, farmers and land managers and conservationists and your home gardeners as well. Um, the main people who are writing this are Sapphire and Roz. So, yeah, um, check out the website because there is some information on there already. Um, and the other project I wanted to talk about was Wild Fungi. So this project, it's aimed at um, making DNA technology more accessible to citizen mycologists and also to try and really increase the speed at which knowledge about Australian fungi and their ecology is being gathered using these new technologies. So the reason for this project is that really very little known. It's about Australian fungi, only about 20% of the mushroom forming species have even been described, 5% of fungi generally maybe. And we don't know much about their lifestyles, like their generation length, sporing or fruiting. And pretty much all of the data that we use for conservation is gathered by citizen mycologists. Um, so that's mostly people just going for walks, um, taking photos of fungi, recording what they find and uploading them to places like iNaturalist. And then they go to the Atlas of Living Australia where, and that's pretty much where all the information about conservation or ecology that you guys know, you know mycologists in Australia comes from, um, is this work by citizen scientists. And it's really important because um, in order to protect fungi under law, we need to assess them, um, assess their threatened status. That's under the U IUCN red list of threatened species. And so far, only about 50 Australian fungi have even been assessed at all. Most of that happened in 2019. Um, so we really need to get more of that happening. And this is just a quick sort of thing about the project. So we're We've got two main methods. One is using a portable DNA sequencer, which is really cool and can tell you all the different fungi in um, an environmental sample, like uh, like some soil. It can also, um, you know, uh, sequence the genomes of fungi or their um, conserved regions. And the second method we're using is 
something called lamp primers, which is essentially a colour change test which can tell you whether a particular species is present or absent in the environment. And that's quite useful for things like um, monitoring invasive species or looking for extremely rare species. And it's fast and cheap and can be done easily in the field. So that's it. Thank you, Emma. Thanks for repeating yourself. Sorry about that. Um, I guess, um, yeah, like Dyke said, I've been working with her for a few years on a local micro project. So I have a little bit of um, experience growing mushrooms, but I'm mostly just a lover of fungi and I spend more time drawing them than doing science. So I'm just here to... Um, talk to all you guys. I wanted just to let the community know that tonight on the YouTube um, comment section, if you want to ask a question, um, some of those will be funneled through to the end, but we've got a couple of volunteers answering questions as we go. So um, feel free to do that the whole time and the like super interesting ones will make it through to the end and I can put them to the panel. Um, so we're going to set, get started with foraging, like safe foraging as our main sort of topic. And I think Simon and Bo are our most experienced foragers. So maybe we'll first go to Simon if you wanted to start talking about safe foraging for us. Cool, yeah. Um, safe foraging. Look, if... If you are going foraging, you're probably going out somewhere into the bush um, and obviously associated with that are some some risks. Um, I think it's really easy to assume that nothing bad is ever going to happen. It's always really beautiful out there. Um, it always feels like such a peaceful place and, you know, the notion of something um, really terrible happening doesn't really cross the mind. Um, I spent a lot of time foraging and camping in the Snowy Mountains uh, years ago when I lived in Wagga Wagga, and it there were more than one uh, close call where I think in hindsight, looking back, uh, myself and my friends could quite easily have lost our lives if we weren't just lucky, because we certainly weren't adequately prepared. Um, and I, I, I think it's just worth bearing that in mind when you are going to go out into the bush, that, that these things do happen. They happen when you're not expecting them. So just prepare for them accordingly. Dress appropriately take enough uh water and food and and whatnot let somebody know where you're going and when you're going to come back um check the conditions for where you're going to as well and make sure that they're actually appropriate don't push your luck driving out into a, a red mud road forest in a small two-wheel drive sedan and hope for the best that it won't snow on you uh i can speak from experience on that one it's not a great idea sometimes um if you add on top of that consumption of the fungus that you might be looking for while you are out in the bush, obviously things become, uh, you know, even more potential for, for catastrophe. Um, and I won't harp on about the wood lovers paralysis, but I think for me, that's a great example of how the unexpected can lead to really difficult situations when you are out in the bush. Um, and I think in that regard, it is so important for somebody to know where you're going uh, and when you are expected back. Um, if you're going somewhere really remote and doing it regularly, I think it's also a really good idea to have yourself a little personal uh, locator beacon, just so that if something bad, really, really bad does happen, you can call for immediate help at the time. Um, and yeah, otherwise, we live in a country with snakes and stuff like that. You do see a lot of them when you are out. And even though it's winter, snakes don't actually hibernate in Australia. Um, they might slow down, but they are still there. So just bear that in mind. Um, I've just redone my first aid certificate. I think it's a super good idea for everyone to go and, and, and do one of those so that you know how to do the basics uh, when you are out in the bush and take a first aid kit with you as well um, because you are never going to know when you need one until you do and it's a bit late to figure that out at the time. So I, I think that's my notion of safe foraging. Um, the big one for me is is making sure that someone knows when you're meant to be coming back. Thanks, Simon. Um, Bo, did you want to add anything or talk about anything uh, else to do with safe foraging? 
Yeah, the most important thing um, when it comes to, say, foraging is basically if, you, if you're foraging for mushrooms, that is just know your species, um, know your mushrooms. That's very important. Um, you've got to know the mushroom, that, especially if you're going to consume it, you've got to make sure 100% that there's no doubt in your mind that what you're consuming is the species that you've targeted. Um, and that's where the online <laughs> forums come in. And there's plenty of people like myself with years of experience who are very happy to identify your mushrooms. But to add on to what Simon's already said, the only thing I can say is know your mushrooms because that is the most important thing. Um, consuming um, unidentified mushrooms is the number one way to make yourself sick and to lead a very short life in this hobby. Um, but that's about all I have to add, thanks. Um, either of you, like, what about, um, like, legalities to do with the land you're on? Like, um, like we're not supposed to be picking from state forests or um, how, how would you like to put that? Try not to pit, uh, don't trespass, number one, because that just adds the extra charge. And also, uh, if they catch you on for private land, they can search you and they get more search powers. Um, so that's pretty important. Uh, when it, try and follow the law, obey the law when you can, because again, not obeying the law will get you into secondary trouble generally. Um, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, if you if you're picking illegal mushroom, mushrooms, well, there's a whole other range of um, problems that come along with that and dangers as well. So you've got to, um, at the end of the day, you've got to make a decision that you're comfortable with. But um, it, 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 the top of my sort of um, mind is uh, habitat destruction, and it's something that I don't like to see. Um, so if you respect the habitat, you will keep getting the mushrooms. But I'll tell you, if you disrespect that habitat and ruin it, you will not get mushrooms. And then you'll also ruin it for the larger uh, species that rely on that habitat and not just the mushrooms. So um, that's that's all I really have to say. Cool. Did anyone else want to add anything to that before we move on? I, I'd just, no? yeah, I'd like to say that... Um... Sorry. The state forest laws vary state to state uh, as well. So um, know what the laws around foraging for fungus are in, in your state. Uh, and bear in mind that state forest in New South Wales isn't the same as state forest in, in Victoria, at least that was my understanding when I moved. Uh, national parks, you're not allowed to touch anything uh, or walk off the tracks. And the fines can be huge, but like fines aside, the national parks are, are national parks for a reason, um, and I think it is you know, good and proper for us to respect the reason that they're there and in that they're supposed to be conserving a space. Um, if you do trespass onto other people's property, you bring down the entire community's standing uh, in the broader society. Um, we're already seeing more police presence in state forests where people are known to go and, and forage for magic mushrooms. Um, that stuff's only going to get worse and worse and worse if people are breaking other rules. Um, and, and in my mind, that also applies to driving sensibly and, and behaving pretty sensibly on the road on your way to and from uh, those areas. Um, just bear in mind that when you are out there, especially and increasingly so, it, it, it's sort of a representation of the entire um, f fungi foraging type community. Um, so I think it's good that we all bear that in mind a little bit as well. Thank you, Simon. Um, Kane, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about lookalikes around about here, if you wanted to take away on that. Oh, yes. Okay. Um... I think really just my main point on lookalikes is is just getting to know the species that you're you're not looking for. Um, but I guess the question comes up of of where do you look? And I, I guess this is where forums and other resources can come in helpful. So, for example, the EGA resource, there's a few species that are mentioned, uh, and there's some YouTube resources as well. So, um, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's there are many species. There are little, many. There are many, many little brown mushrooms, um, and things can look quite similar when you're starting out. So, yeah, spend the time to kind of pick each mushroom and look at it, and, and make sure it has the features that you want. So, if you're not 100 percent on it, get rid of it. So. Uh, every now and then, though, you might find a curiosity. So uh, it is worth kind of maybe posting photos to people to kind of maybe suss it out a, a little bit more. So, um, but I did want to make a point 
about safe foraging as well in terms of um, picking younger specimens. Don't consume older specimens. Uh, many people will report gastro uh, gastrointestinal distress because of eating older funky mushrooms. Slippery jacks are a great example of that. Did you want to add anything about the Amanita or any edible species? Uh, Amanita? <laughs> That's an interesting species. Um, don't eat it fresh like? for lookalikes. Yeah. Um, there are, there's only one lookalike for Amanita muscaria, and that's um, Amanita xanthepalata. Uh, maybe Bo could correct me on that. Uh, Amanita xanthocephala, and that's, yeah, that's the one. A diminutive species that shares more, um, it's got more of orange tones than it will have with the traditional red cap and the white, white spots. Um, the yep. cap tends to go through shades of orange and the spots and the cup at the base seems to have, um, it has orange tinges in it. That, that's the main difference. And, and the size is, is, but the size is the, the most important difference. Of course. Yep. Uh, it also grows in association with eucalyptus as well. Uh, Amanita grows in association with, with pine and other European deciduous trees. Um, so if you're around eucalyptus trees and you find something that looks like an Amanita muscaria, it probably, I'd say it isn't. Um, so it's super important to get positive IDs on these mushrooms before we try and consume them. Um, do would Kane, would you like to tell us how to like take a good photo and where we should go with our information? How to take a good spore print? Like all of these key things about these mushrooms? So to take a good photograph, you want to take a photograph that's kind of back from the mushroom a little bit, get it in its habitat, uh, and then start to take photographs closer up. Get a good photograph of the cap, uh, the stem, uh, maybe its attachment to the wood or, or where it comes out of the soil. Um, I'd recommend carrying some tools like maybe a makeup mirror or you can get these little kind of dentist style mirrors uh, or even kind of like um, rear view mirrors for your helmet or your bicycle. They're really good. They sit in underneath the cap and you should be able to capture a good photo of the gills using your phone using that. Um, the more photos, the better. Um, but those, those principal features are good. Um, don't remove like a whole heap of mushrooms. Maybe just remove one because uh, sometimes the mycelium and the base of the mushroom can be useful for taxonomic reasons. Um, and then in terms of where to get good identification from, um, shroomery. Shroomery is good. Uh, it's very, very responsive forum. Uh, and then, of course, there's Facebook groups. So PMANs, PMANZ, uh, and there's a few other Psilocybe Hunter or Psilocybe Tribe groups as well. Yeah, how about how to take a good spore print in the field? Bo, did you want to let us know about that? Uh, in the field is a bit different, but uh, if you can take a, if you can take one specimen home, a mature specimen, um, with uh, from a legal place, of course, don't take them from national parks. Um, you can take them home, um, a piece of foil or a glass, even uh, if you have a, a flat piece of glass is is good. And then you can use um, after you take the spore print, you can use different shades of paper and put the glass on because uh, spore prints. Uh, every gender of mushroom has a different spore print. For example, uh, the psilocybe gender uh, gender have uh, a purple brown spore print. So um, if you take your mushroom cap, uh, the cap, and the mushroom, and you remove the stalk and you place the mushroom down on some foil, uh, you can put a cup over the top of it and it'll prevent the mushroom from drying out and also preventing wind currents from pushing your spores away while, the, while they drop. The mushroom cap will drop um, uh, microscopic um, spores onto that foil and uh, after uh, several hours, um, six to 12 hours, generally overnight's good, uh, and remove the cup, uh, uh, remove the cup and then remove the cap and you'll see that there'll be a spore print left on the foil. 
Um, so some sometimes, like if you use white paper, for example, for an Amanita muscaria, yeah, Amanita muscaria has a white okay. spore print. So if you spore print onto white, white paper, you won't see that spore print. So it's good to use uh, tin foil because you can always kind of generally hold it in the light and you can see what colour that spore print is. And that can aid you in identification, um, at least to, to genus, uh, with the other features that Kane was explaining that you, that you use when you take a photo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think... Kane's also got a um, reading list put together for um, further reading after this talk. So that'll be available. Um, we'll let you know where, as well as a spore print document, don't you, Kane? I do. Yes, there's a document on how to create spore prints. Uh, I think it's on the resource page on the entheogenesis.org website. Cool. Um, I think we should go into toxicology. I think, Simon, um, you can tell us a little bit more about how we can poison ourselves. Uh, look, I'm sure there are endless uh, possible options to achieve that if that was your goal. Um, there's a lot of fairly toxic mushrooms around, yet really dangerous levels of, of um, poisoning are reasonably uncommon in Australia. Um, the most common cause of really serious mushroom poisonings or fatal mushroom poisonings in Australia is Amanita phylloids. Um, it grows in association with oak and, and more so in the southern cooler states. Canberra has quite a lot of them in season. They even put up signs as a result. Um, you wouldn't be able to mistake that for a psilocybe mushroom or any of the real common edible species that people forage for. Um, yet it still is a good idea to know what that one looks like. Um, it, the mushrooms that you're more likely to accidentally ingest if you incorrectly identify them as a psilocybe can still include some fairly um, toxic ones like the gallerina, uh, autumnalis or marginata or patagonica. Um, and uh, some of the inosybe can have, I think, muscarine in them as well. The the amount of those mushrooms you need to eat to cause a serious poisoning seems to be high enough that it doesn't happen that often. Um, I don't necessarily believe that a lot of people who are foraging for psilocybe are good enough at identifying that they don't occasionally ingest some of those, um, which isn't to say get complacent about it and that they won't kill you if you eat one or two. Uh, it's just to say that um, that it, it doesn't happen that often and if you take the right precautions, it's unlikely to. If you think you have ingested a toxic mushroom uh, or even a mushroom that you come to find or think wasn't what you thought it was when you ate it, do not wait. Um, especially with amatoxin poisoning, it's a, it's a like a biphasic toxidrome. So you'll, you'll get sick with gastrointestinal symptoms, then you'll get better. Uh, and then several days later, your liver will start to fail. So the better, you, the, the quicker you get to some medical assistance, the better. Um, always call the poisons hotline and basically just follow their advice. They'll probably tell you to go to the hospital. Uh, if you do, try to take a sample of the mushroom you think you ate with you um, and, and let them know what, what's happened. You are not going to get in trouble if you go to a hospital and say, hey, I was trying to take magic mushrooms and I think I stuffed up and took the wrong thing. Um, and that's a hell of a lot better than ending up uh, sick or, or dead. Um, but it, it really is a pretty avoidable thing, I think. Um, and as Bo said, the, the number one thing when you're picking them is to really know what you're picking. Um, the wood lover's paralysis is sort of a separate a separate thing because it does happen when you are eating the the, the target mushrooms. Um, it hasn't, as far as we know, led to any lasting uh, medical consequences for for people that have that have had it. That's not to say that it can't either, but it it hasn't yet, and that um, I think should should lend some confidence that hopefully that's a, a difficult thing to do serious damage uh, with. Cool. Thanks for that, Simon. Um, I think it's a good spot now to probably talk about a little bit more of um, a few things that you wanted to talk about, um, like the pharmacology and therapeutic potential of psilocybin and the limitations of the current research. 
Yeah, cool. I think the therapeutic potential is um, massive and we're only really just scraping the surface. Uh, most of the people watching have probably followed to some extent what uh, what psilocybin is being used and trialled for at the moment. Um, Treatment-resistant depression uh, is one thing. End-of-life anxiety is another big thing. Um, they're about to start a trial at St. Vincent's uh, in Sydney about uh, using psilocybin for methamphetamine dependence as well, which I think is a another great area of potential. Um, I, I won't talk about that much, but what I think potentially we could start looking at and hopefully will start looking at is its potential application for maintenance of wellness and health. Um, it, if we're only waiting until people are already clinically depressed before we're utilising something that could potentially prevent that, I think we're missing the boat and causing, well, not causing, but but allowing suffering to happen when it doesn't necessarily need to. Um, so I'm hopeful that down the line, uh, the safety profile of psilocybin will be well enough accepted that they can start using it ethically in people who may not currently meet clinical criteria to go into a, a trial where really they're they're usually at the moment looking at psilocybin for treatment resistant cases of other uh, mental health issues. Um, the limitations of the current research is that they've all only been very small pilot trials. Um, I know everyone was very excited about the application to the TGA to reschedule psilocybin. The evidence at the moment only really comes from very small trials. Um, a lot of them are open, uh, not open label, but there's there's no real placebo control, which is difficult to achieve for something that powerful as well. But without going too much into the specifics, essentially, while everybody who's been around these things for a while probably feels pretty confident that they can help in a lot of these situations, in order for it to become a, a medical um, tool, uh, the evidence we should be looking for really is the same level of evidence we'd expect the medical community to present for any other prescribed drug. Um, and at, at this stage, I think there's still a little way to go before we've got that level of evidence. Um, and I think it's just really great that that work is being done and increasingly being done uh, quickly. Um, one of the things about the psilocybin trials too is that they are looking at isolated synthetic psilocybin and not, not looking at the other molecules that come with mushrooms as a whole organism. Um, and I think that while that's probably necessary at this stage in the early days of psilocybin as a potential therapeutic, um, we could really miss out. It's It would be like giving people THC whole cannabis and denying them the rest of the molecules that are incredibly useful either individually or synergistically. Thanks, Starfight. Um, we're going to swap to a little bit more about conservation now. Emma, I think you're our resident most, um, well, you know, you know the most about conservation, so let us all know. Well, I think, oh, sorry, my weird on my screen. <laughs> uh, I think, I guess, the most important thing I wanted people to take out from today is to, well, one, don't overpick, but also do really good field hygiene because um, we currently we have a we have a few fairly invasive fungi and also, I mean, plants can also and water moulds, but um, that have been spreading across the country. Um, myrtle rust is one that's basically, it's like a plant pandemic. It's going to kill off 16 species of rainforest trees in the next 10 years, um, at least in the wild. And we have things like this little orange ping pong bat fungus. I might actually just like show the slides so that people can know what to look out for. Sorry. <laughs> um, rather than trying to describe them. Hang on. Ah, I've lost Zoom now. Okay. <laughs> so this is um, the orange ping pong bats on the left. Um, and they're actually really tiny. They're only about maybe a centimetre across at the most. Um, and they're just invading across most of Victoria at the moment. They put out um, put out chemicals that attack other fungi. So 
yeah, they're actually pretty bad. Um, but they aren't in a couple of places like the Grampians and Wombat Forest yet. Um, on the right is the Myrtle Rust I was talking about. And there's also the Amanita muscaria, which it's also an entheogen. So I know that people collect it and use it, um, but it can become mycorrhizal with some Australian plant species and push those and push out other native plants. I mean, other native fungi. Um, so just be very mindful if you go into the pine forest and collect these to wash all your clothes afterwards, wash your car um, and your shoes, hats and equipment before you go out into any sort of natural bush areas um, so that you don't take these, these pest fungi with you. Um, if you're going to two places, like you're going out on a bushwalk and you're going to a pine forest, go on the bushwalk first and then go to the pine forest. Um, yeah, and just, you know, so that we can at least slow these down so that um, native species have the, um, have at least some time to adapt, you know, if we can't stop them. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my screen here. Uh, yeah, but the other thing is I noticed lately a lot of people have been sort of spreading spores of um, psilocybe species around deliberately. Um, it's probably, it's a, that's okay if you're doing it in your backyard, but it's probably not great to be doing it out in the bush or, um, you know, because even though this is a native species and, you know, it's important for species in the ecosystem, one, even native species can become weedy if they're transferred, you know, from where they're indigenous, like the locations they normally grow to other, you know, areas of bush. And also we, we don't know enough about Sabe rugginosa. Um, we want to, you know, we want to find out is this one species, is it a species complex or a species arc? And if people just keep moving these populations around, we won't get a chance to learn that. Does anyone else have anything to add on the cons conservation sort of front? <laughs> Everyone's keeping it so short tonight. So um, I do. Cool, dark light it is. Yeah. Okay, I mean, one of the first things that we need to do as mycologists is acknowledge that um, most of us as Europeans, we live on stolen land. And by walking and, and, ta and taking things off site, um, we, most of us are doing it without permission. And it would be good to see us initiate um, some very gentle discussions with the traditional owners of the land. I'm, I'm not aware of that being done by any mycology people. Um, and I think that's mission critical. But, but secondarily, the, the, there's a lot of people you see on Facebook who pick just everything and then spread it out in a sheet and say, what are these mushrooms? The question is, do you need, do you need to pick them at all? Um, can you just take photos and not move the locations that they're in, not spread the spores anywhere? and go back and get them later. I mean, what's the rush? Unmute. <laughs> um, I totally agree with you. We do need to start, um, you know, some discussions with Indigenous people about these kind of things. Um, and that also kind of reminded me of something else I wanted to talk about, which is people taking, which in some ways is really great, but it could be improved, is that a lot of people have been taking samples of fungi and setting them overseas to get sequenced, um, which is wonderful. I think it's a really cool that people are that interested in fungi, but um, the problem with this is um, it's by sending it overseas and by not having the proper permissions to collect from public land or you can collect from private land if you have permission from the owner, but by doing that, it, it means that those um, sequences you get back, they can't really be used for science because they haven't been, um, they're not, they haven't, the specimen hasn't been lodged in a herbarium, which means that it's not, the experiment isn't replicable. Nobody can go and check on that DNA sequence and see if you got it right or if there was a mistake in the sequencing. But the other issue is that it's in violation of the protocol, which um, is an international treaty against biopiracy. And this was brought in for really good reasons, which is that some unethical scientists and corporations were going into um, 
native lands in countries such as India and taking medicinal plants and and then turning them into um, commercial products and patenting them so that the people who traditionally used those um, medicines couldn't even use them anymore. So this is why we have this international treaty. And, and the reality is the Australian government never signed that treaty because it was, you know, we're under a conservative government that wasn't interested in that kind of thing at the time it was brought in. But most herbariums and scientists do try to abide by it because it's a really important thing. So as part of why we're doing this wild DNA thing, we want to get this sequencing happening in Australia. So, um, and happening with, um, with the proper collection permits and herbarium specimens lodged. And we now have a permit to collect in Victoria. So if people want to collect, please. We I think are. We lost Emma's sound there. Kane, did you want to say something before? Um. I did want to say something. I was just simply going to mirror pretty much what Darklight had said. Um, she covered kind of the point that I wanted to cover. Uh, and I just wanted to just say that, yeah, there's there's no hurry. The, the mushroom will be, will be there for a couple of days. You know, you can take photographs, you can get it ID'd. We all carry portable devices around on us now. And I guess unless you're really out deep in the forest and you lose signal, uh, you, you can get a mushroom identified fairly quickly. You take the appropriate photographs, you upload it to iNaturalist or to Shroomery. Well, the Shroomery is probably a little bit more challenging with a mobile phone, to be honest, uh, or at least kind of one of the Facebook groups and, and you can get it identified. You don't have to kind of, you don't have to pick the mushroom to get it identified. Um, Thanks, Kane. Um, back to Emma. Sorry, we lost you for a sec there. Uh, I know, I, I froze. Um, I think where I stopped was I was just saying um, we, my community has finally got a permit to collect in Victoria for the scientific purposes. So if you have an interesting specimen, please contact us because we can legally collect it, lodge it with the herbarium, and we can do DNA work on it as well. Um, you know, that's why we're doing this wild fungi project and we're working on getting a permit for Queens, um, for New South Wales um, eventually. And I think the QMS, uh, Queensland Mycological Society has an, their own permit. So if you're in Queensland, you can um, possibly join up with them. But yeah. Beautiful. And like, it was quite difficult to get that permit. It took about 12 months, didn't it, Emma? Um, you know what? It was difficult, but I think in the end it was because of staffing issues under COVID because the person suddenly, um, someone suddenly appeared and fixed everything and I just think it was staffing issues and not necessarily always going to be a problem. So, yeah, <laughs> it was weird. But, oh, and they gave us a permit for um, plant parts because apparently Dell WP no longer recognises more than two kingdoms. But... <laughs> <laughs> Um, does someone uh, want to speak to intellectual property with all our, all this new micro knowledge? Anyone? Kane? Darklight? <laughs> Everyone? <laughs> um, we'll start with... I, love me. I would love to do it. It's, it's something I feel really yeah. passionate about. As having seen the um, early days of the uh, legal cannabis industry, um, and also seeing the popularity of bush foods. I mean, there's this, they're two completely separate strands, but you've got Indigenous IP and you've got Indigenous um, ownership of germplasm rights. I'm, you guys may know this better than me, but what I would hate to see is the commercialisation of Australian bush tucker mushrooms become another macadamia scenario where suddenly they appear mysteriously on the commercial market and... It becomes European IP rather than Indigenous IP. Um, they looked after the place till we got here, and they're the reason that these mushrooms are here. We're rapidly screwing the environment. Um, but I think that I think the market the market grab at the other end, the psilocybin, is absolutely going to be brutal, 
and it's going to be potentially commercially driven, which is going to deny a lot of people opportunity to take part both as patients and as researchers unless we can get to a model of legislation that allows it they, the way they're going in the United States with legalisation of psilocybin recreationally. That, that just opens it up for citizen crime completely. Um, you may not be able to make commercial claims on it. Sorry, Kane. Yep, go. You're the, you're the guy. You know. You know way more about that than me. I think that's also another reason why it'd be really good to be able to do these studies in Australia. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest from overseas in terms of, like, particularly, okay, we're talking psilocybe. What is psilocybe seborrheicinosa? Is it it's part of a, the cyanesins or seborrheicinosa complex? Um, but that's closely related to azuresins and cyanesins. So it's, it's, people kind of curious about what this relationship is. And it seems, and, and seborrheicinosa is of particular interest there. Um, it would be good to have that work done in Australia rather than overseas in order to be able to maintain then that um, our own ownership over that and also the Indigenous ownership over that. Hence why I guess uh, Emma and I kind of share this feeling that we should be a little bit cautious about sending specimens overseas when we then lose, we lose our control over that data that then goes overseas and is used by people overseas. Yep. Go, Alice. Um, Go, Dr. Lowe. And it's, and it's that easy. It totally gets scammed. That happened with one of my early samples. I mean, sequencing overseas is even cheaper than it is in Australia, and it's quite reasonably priced in Australia. Now you guys have got the min eye on. That opens the field right up. But a few years ago, I submitted a sample to an overseas facility. Uh, it was a mushroom from a local population. It was safely edible. We were looking at doing some closer population study. And a, an overseas data publisher said, that's amazing. You should give that to me because then we can put it up. And that immediately made the whole thing inaccessible to Organisations like ALA and Fungi Map because there was no herbarium specimen that never presented an option, and it's that easy to get seduced by it when you're when you're in the early phase of collection. But it does deny Australian researchers the chance of validating that data or working with it in the fullest sense. Thanks, Simon. Did you want to add anything? You had your hand up before. Oh, sorry, Emma. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm, I'm sort of terrified about what's going to happen in the therapeutic psilocybin um, space in, in coming years. Um, I think it's a bit of a different picture in the US now where they're decriminalising the use of those mushrooms, um, which means that even after pharmaceutical preparations that, that you buy from the chemist are available, eating the mushroom itself will still be something anyone can do. Uh, if in this country somebody manages to get a TGA approved psilocybin product to market, which will cost them hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars and require a lot of connections uh, in order to make that happen. Um, I can see a lot of reasons why people with vested interests would then not want people to have free and easy access to those substances. Um, and it's really easy for the medical establishment to argue that they're only safe when they're being used under heavily controlled, heavily supervised uh, conditions, um, which I think a lot of us would, would question um, at least. And um, I, I think then that we need to be a little bit mindful about the, the impact that essentially any progress towards medicalization isn't necessarily good progress for access, um, broadly speaking. And the way the trials are done where you've got two therapists, one psychiatrist, one psychologist sitting with you for eight hours during the experience, yes, you're talking about thousands of dollars just for that supervision during that experience, uh, which the Medicare and PBS are just never going to cover uh, when SSRIs are, are a lot cheaper. Um, 
So yeah, that that that's my concern, and I think we we should all be mindful of um, what sort of movement in that area where we're supporting, um, and and be a little bit critical of of what motivations might be. Um, Emma, you had something. Yeah, um, I think there's. I don't think it's you know a hypothetical risk with um with the IP stuff and um, biopiracy. I think that with the medicinal fungi that we have here, um, you know, the native psilocybe, but also some of the other cordyceps and things. I think there's a, you know quite a high chance of well, not maybe not a high chance, but there's a real risk of someone sending this overseas to the wrong person or the wrong lab and them just sort of sweeping it up. And the thing is, patent sweeping is a big thing in mycology. Like it's particularly been a problem in um, mycomaterials. I've seen, you know, just just growing something to the shape of its container is now patented, which I just find bizarre. Um, but, you know, there's also been, I've seen patents which clearly would not work but the and that have been dropped, but these companies, they just... Um, they think of every idea they can. They write the patents, put them in, they get patented, and then they test them afterwards to see whether they work, and then they drop the patent if it doesn't work. So, like, there's, you know, really consistent patent sweeping going on, and I can't really see why that wouldn't be happening in, you know, medicinal areas as well. The other thing is that, you know, getting sequencing is cheap in Australia now, like Darklight said. Um, with the minion, we've got it down to, like, we can get it down to if we get enough um, if we get enough samples from people. Like if you send samples in, and that we can do a lot at once, we can get it down to maybe two or three dollars a sample for sequencing. It's really really cheap. And if you send it to AGRF, um, you can probably get the ITS region done for about twenty bucks. And they do they do um, they do extraction as well um, if you don't know how to do that stuff. So which might be a little bit more, but it's a lot cheaper than sending it to Spain. And the other thing is that Australian scientists, frankly, have a lot better knowledge of Australian ecology than people in other countries who've never visited Australia. Like, that's not, you know, that's not to say that there's not space for collaboration with scientists overseas. There is, and people collaborate all the time. But just because someone's an expert in North American fungi doesn't mean that they're an expert in Australian ecology or even that they really know all that much about taxonomy or you know what what um regions of the genome should be used yeah um thanks emma um dark light do you want to speak on the importance of um local libraries and how hard it is to store stuff as citizen scientists i think most of us can speak to that fairly easily um We've been setting up a local fungal library just out of interest. Uh, we started with food and then moved to, to a few medicinal species and then the fungi explosion happened and we started realising that the mushrooms around us are an important part of the ecosystem. Whether or not they've got anything to do with us, they've got their own reasons for being here. Um, I'm not sure. Is anyone else here aware of a centralised Australian microbank? Anyone? Uh, I think there is, sorry for jumping in, uh, I think there's a centre in New South Wales that does keep specimens uh, and I think a few other facilities around the place do have, have, have fungal libraries but they may be old and that could pose a problem. Uh, so whether they're stored in liquid culture, uh, say sterile water, or um, lyophilized, is it lyophilized cultures, the, the freeze-dried mm. cultures? Um, yeah. yeah. You know, like, um, are we able to actually restore those cultures if they've been in storage for twenty years? You know, like how how viable actually are they? And that's exactly right. And what genetic changes have taken place? I mean, you know, science has been decimated as a field in the last 30 years. We're churning out lots of scientists, but they all end up working in B&Bs and good jobs. And when you're looking at centres that should be storing these things, they should be staffed by people who are turning the collections over regularly. 
to make sure that they're viable and they maintain their genetic integrity, that they're representative, that they're not contaminated. Um, what about with the lizard species? Okay. Okay. Uh, there was a taxonomy convention last year for Australia, and there was lots of discussion during that about the need for developing fungal libraries. Tom May was, was you know, very to the point on, we need to do this. This is something that needs to happen, and we need to work out how to do it sooner rather than later. Um, but he also did acknowledge at the same time the need for good citizen science and for for good foragers to be out there, you know, finding the specimens that we then need to be able to culture these fungi. I mean, Jess and I, Jess and I started it as a passion project to uh, kickstart her laboratory work in mycology, but we both very quickly cottoned on to the, it's a long-term commitment. Um, and it's, you, you've got to have multiple backup strategies is something that stores well every in sterile water for five years might be dead after six. Um, we were storing things under paraffin for a while, which was the gold standard for people who don't have alkalizers. Then we realised that some species have contaminants that like the paraffin, and when you pull them back out, you've got more contaminant than you have. Um, and that you have to go back to your collections and regularly cycle them to make sure that they're still, they still maintain that vitality to give you the kind of fruit. And then the macro funding, we've got nothing, we've got no knowledge, next to no knowledge of mycofungi, microfungi, and they're going to be the really important ones for carbon well and all that sort of thing. Um, Emma, did I miss your hand up before? No, I think it's all good. Um, So, no, okay, cool. I think we're gonna, oh, okay. Oh, look, I'd just like to add to that, that, um, you know, anyone who's interested in helping with fungi conservation, learning how to do tissue cultures and learning how to identify the species in your region and then maybe work out uh, non-intrusive ways of taking tissue cultures. Um, it'd be a good little kind of practice to a hobby to kind of start up. I think there's going to come a point in the future where a lot of these kind of citizen science tissue cultures may come in helpful. Um, mycologists are dreadfully rare and underpaid or don't have time anyway. <laughs> but they, you know, so we're dependent on citizen science really to push the field of mycology in Australia. So whether it be just getting out there and identifying species or learning how to culture them yourself. Yeah, that's all very, very much needed, I think. Um, does anyone have anything to add before we move on to questions? No, everyone looks pretty happy. So our first question is can anyone describe what foraging is like and why they enjoy it so much? I think that'll be everyone. So if we start um, with Bo and then we'll go through everyone. Oh, to me, foraging is a bit different to what I do, but it's something that I do do. But foraging is um, looking for edible mushrooms, something to eat. Um, I primarily go out with a focus on um, finding new species and taking a new photograph of something that I haven't seen before. Um, from a photo, both as a challenge as a photographer, as a, trying to get a photo on the field is a challenge, and I enjoy that challenge. Um, so uh, to me, that's basically what I like doing. Um, but I like mushroom hunting. I love mushroom hunting. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, and then when it comes to the foraging, what does foraging mean to me, and why I like it so much? I like it because um, I get to use all my senses as a human being. I get to go out and escape the city. I get to open up. Uh, I get to tune out from the external sources and. Uh, through that, I become calm. That's why I like it. Uh, and then secondary, I get to bring home uh, some kind, some kai, some food. You know, um, I'm from uh, from New Zealand. Uh, I've got a, a strong association with Maori background, and so um, living off the land is something that's important to me. And it gives me a connection to um, 
where I come from, which is the earth. So that's why I enjoy it. And I suppose that's what gets me out there is um, just enjoying the great outdoors. Beautiful. Thanks, Bo. How about you, Simon? Yeah, I, I um, totally agree with Bo. I mean, I do a bit of foraging, but also just the thrill of the hunt is a wonderful experience. If you are looking for something and you've spent the time looking at maps and figuring out conditions and walking through the bush and getting eaten by leeches, when you do finally find it, it's awfully rewarding. Um, and it's it's like mindfulness in practice for me. You're always in a, a beautiful space. Somehow even monoculture pine has a, a way to look um, gorgeous in the right conditions when it's not logged flat. Um, and it's yeah it's a time away from from other thoughts you you end up so lost in looking at the ground that um you know you could walk past a purple elephant floating 10 feet off the ground and you wouldn't even notice it um i think that's beautiful uh and the ability to find some delicious food and there really are some delicious common edible species around in australia is uh, always a really rewarding feeling um you you can't get much more connected to the source of of your meal than that uh, and i love it cool thanks simon um kane oh uh, i i just love getting out into the forest you know it's just this the it just the silence or it's not silence just the quiet the mindfulness the just being able to have that time to yourself to really focus on on you and the environment around you uh, and to be able to kind of tune out from all the noise and everything else that goes on in our daily lives and just just wander and, and just observe. Um, in terms of fungi, uh, oh, there's just something magical about them. There's just something, you know, the, the way they just pop up out of, out of these places and... They're just there. They're just these beautiful organisms. Um, I guess I'm also short-sighted, so I, I like really fine, delicate features of things, and I really like kind of, you know, observing the mushrooms from that level. And, of course, food. Yeah, let's go food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can totally feel you on the short-sighted thing. Um, Emma, do you, can you tell us how foraging, looking at mushroom makes you feel? Yeah, short-sighted too, so, but, um, uh, yeah, for me, like, if, if I go for a walk or a hike, normally you know, it's tough for me to stop. I'll be buzzing and having thoughts about this or that and my life and, you know, it's hard to calm down. But if I go mushroom hunting, I, I'm really focusing on, you know, looking for this specific thing and looking at the detail of the forest and looking at the ground, and it actually really calms me down and focuses my mind and makes me able to observe parts of the forest, which I would normally just, you know, wouldn't notice. And, you know, when you go on a mushroom forage, like, you know, the cliche with forays is you, you, you know, you, you barely made it 30 metres from the car park after two hours because you're just focused on this detail in the forest. And, yeah, I just really like that, you know, forcing my mind to slow down. And, <laughs> and, and it's also it's just like an Easter egg hunt. It's fun finding, you know colourful or edible things in the forest. <laughs> cool. Darklight, I know I know you think plants took over your life, but how do they make you feel? <laughs> well, mushrooms, foraging. Are we on the foraging question? Awesome. Because um, I'm lazy, I live in the bush and I hate going to the shops and there's like, Species that grow in my backyard that when they're on, I can make some really nice macro of. I'm not much of a bushwalker. Um, I probably wouldn't forage for native species if I was on a bushwalk. But gee, I'd like to learn some more about foraging for the European ones because, as far as I'm concerned, they're weed and you can eat them, and apparently they're delicious. What about you, Jess? You're more of a forager than me. Oh, uh like it's the details and the drawings and the art I can make later with the more data of things I look at. I think like it all integrates and comes out as something later on. So I love all of it. And I live in the forest. I couldn't be away from it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. 
Um, question two, can you tell us more about how to contribute to citizen science and its value? So I think, Kane, maybe we'll start with you. Okay, I can speak to that. Um, taking really good photographs and contributing them to iNaturalist um, is, is a huge help. Uh, even if you think the species is quite common, uh, making photographs of it and, and submitting um, a photo to iNaturalist can, can be helpful. I, in my short video, I kind of mentioned like Cubensis, for example. We don't know the, the full range of it in Australia. Um, Eleutheria is another one. We would like to know more of its range. Uh, and it's and the other thing with iNaturalist, it's, it's not just tracking where it occurs, it's, it's tracking when it occurs. So you can get graphs of, of, of where it occurs during the year. So also seasonality. Uh, I think other ways to contribute to citizen sciences, as I mentioned earlier, learning how to do tissue cultures and learning how to do uh, take small samples and tissue culture them without really disturbing the mushrooms. I think that in time can contribute in huge ways. <clears throat> Does anyone have anything to add on the citizen science? Yeah, Bo, thank you. Just like to add to what Kane said about iNaturalist. iNaturalist is very important, but within iNaturalist, there's um, things called projects, and there's a project running in Australia called FungiMap at the moment, uh, and that's uh, correlated. Uh, Dr. Tom May's involved. He's a senior my mycologist at um, the Melbourne Herbarium. Uh, yeah, but any mushroom that you find, if you can, when you add it to iNaturalist, it's got a, a project sort of tab, and you can click down and type in FungiMap and it'll let you um, add it to the project and then it will just ask you for its habitat, at this, you know, um, uh, and the substrate it was growing on and et cetera like that. If you enter it in those fields, then that goes off to the FungiMap project and they've also got a website and I recommend that you look it up and you donate to them and you support them because they're, they're very good. Um, and, yeah, the data will help uh, the people who run FungiMap to be able to draw a larger picture of the mushrooms that we have here. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, support FungiMap. But there's also uh, other websites like Mushroom Observer that they use that a lot of people from around the world also uh, post to and a lot of experts post on there and you can get good feedback from them and talk to them in, in real time through comments. So um, that's another website. But uh, iNaturalist and the FungiMap project is uh, quite important. Emma? Um. I think one really important thing that you can do is to find a local reserve or, you know, if you live in the bush or local area or a nearby park or something and get to know that area really, really well because, you know, it's it, – I've found personally it's one thing to go for lots of walks and take lots of pictures of different mushrooms. I find it very hard to learn how to ID that way, but – when I started going to the same spot all the time, then I started to really get to know that piece of bush better and, you know, the patterns that emerge over time, like which mushrooms pop up when and what are the sort of triggers and the different species in the area. So I think it's 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 good to start slow and start small in a piece of bush that you want to get to know and, you know, maybe get later on, you know, help protect, like help protect it from weeds or from um environmental destruction so yeah I just think starting with a small area is, is good um and also if you want to get involved with any community stuff please contact us we're hoping to get to the point where we can start training people soon um it's a bit hard with COVID though beautiful thank you um next question how prevalent is police presence when foraging for mushrooms? Um, I think, Simon, you ha you knew a little bit about this before? Um, look, only from what we hear secondhand mostly. I've, I've sort of never uh, seen them directly when out in the forest. Um, there are – it depends a lot on where you are, I think. Uh, there are parts of the country that are well-known, uh, won't mention by name, but some parts in WA are heavily policed. Um, and I think to the point where you'd, you'd almost have a difficult time thinking it was a good idea to go there. Um, I think you can – 
avoid drawing negative attention to yourself and and others who are doing that by acting responsibly, not being obnoxious, not doing your burnout when you leave the car park at the forest, taking your rubbish with you, picking up a bag of rubbish while you are out walking as well. Um, and it, that, I think that's all you can really do to, to try to um, reduce the likelihood that you have a, a difficult encounter um, and be aware of your rights as well when that, if that does happen. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, we're not... Yeah, we we like the police. We just <laughs> want to be safe, make sure everyone's safe. So thanks for that. Um, are there, next question. Are there any desires to lobby government to remove the fungies from the bro prohibition category? And who would like to speak on that? Is that Simon again? Look, unless somebody else wants to say, I'll just mention that um, there has been that application to the TGA recently um, to have them moved into Schedule 8 of the um, the scheduling of substances. Uh, that's the same category that morphine and other, um, you know, drugs of dependence, as far as they're concerned, high-risk drugs are scheduled in. Um that would make them prescribable but not possessable without a prescription. That is very different to decriminalisation, which is also different to legalisation. Um, and if they were moved into Schedule 8, you would still be up for the same charge, essentially, if you had them on you without a prescription as um, as you would be now. So um, there are, and in the ACT, I think as well, there's about to be a proposal put forward. They're reviewing their drug policy there at the moment. And there's hope that that we can make a push for decriminalisation. The APS, uh, I think at the moment, planning to submit something for that. Cool. Thanks, Simon. I think like, personally, I think it'd be a good place to start if we got the psilocybes into a guide. Um, like Kane's bit of on the subs. So Kane, would you like to? <laughs> I think you preempted me on that one. Um, Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, where was I going? <laughs> <laughs> the we don't know enough about psilocybin in Australia and in, in many other countries because of the legal restrictions. You know, the, the paperwork that mycologists have to go through in order to be able to study this this genera properly uh, is quite prohibitive. So I know certainly from that level, yeah, reducing the paperwork necessary to be able to study this species, uh, to really be able to look at its whole population dynamics, um, uh, and that that's Cubensis as well as Veriginosa and other and other groups. I, and there are species still being discovered here in Australia, um, but no one really wants to touch this because of just the, the whole paperwork process. So yeah. Well, like with the guides though, like is that they just don't want the trouble, or they're just ignoring a mushroom? Um, what what guide do you mean to like all guides? Like they do most of the field guides. Yeah, they, they do mention, mention them, they, they do like, mention them, but yeah. then there's kind of there are questions about you know they call them poisonous and toxic or neurotoxic, uh, and that comes from kind of old science essentially. Um, yeah is just a lack of understanding of what the compounds are. Uh, this comes back to, I think, this cultural kind of prohibition on psychoactive chemicals. Um, so when we're talking seborrheic and it being a psilocybe and a neurotoxin, I, th I think it's just that a certain part of the academic community just missed that whole kind of subtlety of, of what the chemical is, psilocybin. So we should just print out your new guide and staple it into the back, right? That's right. <laughs> nice. Uh, next question. Has Amanita pantherina ever been found in Australia? Both? 
not to my knowledge, it's a North American species or it's not. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, but yeah, it hasn't been found here, but we've uh, got an, other mushrooms. Amanita muscaria is in the same section, uh, section muscaria, uh, as, as, uh, or section Amanita, sorry, as, um, as Amanita pantherina. So the, the chemicals, obtanic acid and muscamol, the ones that are present in Amanita pantherina are present in um, Amanita muscaria. But in saying that, Possession of Amanita muscari and picking them is also an offence under Australian law. So you've got to be careful that what you're doing doesn't get yourself into trouble. Uh, and also those mushrooms need to be treated differently uh, to psilocybin mushrooms. You can't just consume them raw. Um, and more information can be that found online about that. And I suggest you do that. Okay. Yeah, the active compound in Amanita muscari, um, muscimol is a Schedule 9 compound uh, so to be treated in the same sense of psilocybin uh, whether Amanita pantherina occurs in Australia yeah, I, I'm not sure either um, but you could always check iNaturalist or Atlas of a Living Australia to see if any records okay so next one is how can you stop cubes from aborting <laughs> Bo? Um, there's a bit to that question, but um, it really follow a trusted tech. Um, I'm a, an admin on the Shroomery Facebook group and a moderator on the Shroomery forums, but I suggest you hit up the forums there and uh, uh, someone will be able to tell you um, exactly how to stop that. But basically, it would probably be a fresh air exchange issue, um, uh, but it could be many things. It could also be the... Um, uh, the amount of moisture in your bulk substrate. So, um, yeah, that's about all I can say on that. Okay, so next question. Why aren't subs found in far north Queensland? And uh, We'll start with Simon. Who says they're not? Um, I was blown away to see subs in subtropical rainforest, not that high above sea level in northern New South Wales. Um and they're, they're found in southeast Queensland at altitude. Um, so you might be the first to find them. Uh, they do like colder conditions, though. But, but again, uh, where I found them in, in northern New South Wales is a, a colder microclimate that, uh, you know, you, you leave that part of the forest and it's very much tropical weather. So it's amazing how much of an impact that localised microclimate can have on what species fruit in that spot. Um, so I think it's more important to think about it that way than regionally to some extent. Um, and Bo? Well, you might not have subaerogenosa, but there'd be other species like Solosibi papuana, for example. You'd say you've got your tropical and subtropical species. And, but like Simon was saying, there's probably no one out there looking for them. So the more people that look for these things, uh, the more data that comes through. And in my time about doing this into 20 years, there's been – it's just a torrent of new species that come through every year. Um, I, I'm, I'm constantly getting contacted by people finding um, species where they're not supposed to be. So um, go out and look and you might be surprised. How do we know if subs are native? Um, Emma, did you want to start with this one? Um, it's my understanding that they're not native, that they've come from the air. could be wrong, but, um, uh, yeah, until we do proper taxonomy on these things and, I mean, like, you know, get a bunch of sequences and, you know, work out, you know, what's their relationship to other fungi and stuff. We don't really know whether a lot of the species growing in Australia are natives or are imported or are, you know, just species that grow, grow everywhere in the world. Yeah I, had, yeah, I had an interesting talk with Kane about this other night. Go, Kane. Uh, my feelings are they're endemic because essentially... Um, we we have an interesting group of species between Australia and New Zealand. So we have Sveragonaceae in Australia and we have uh, Waroa in New Zealand. And through IKS studies, they've been found to be very, very closely related indeed. Um, the thing with Waroa is it's become... Uh, 
it's a cotyoid. So it's, it's becoming essentially like a truffle-like mushroom, uh, and that has required evolutionary pressure to be able to evolve that, that feature. Uh, and then we also have an in-between uh, species as well, uh, the Thalosophy varroa the sub uh, which is kind of an intermediate. It has the cat, but it's starting to kind of join. Uh, and so that's for, for me indicates that there's probably a, a good uh, endemism going on there between the two. I'm going to let Emma jump in. Um, yeah, I just want to correct myself because it's almost 10 o'clock and my brain's not working and I was thinking cubes while saying subs. Um, I absolutely agree. I think, they're, um, I, I think subs are native. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and then I'm going to jump back in and just go, there seems to be good evidence that um, maybe some of the overseas relatives have been introduced. So azuricins uh, may have been potentially been introduced, certainly given the fact that they're, they're growing in a relationship with an introduced grass in Pacific Northwest. Uh, and cyanesins is also problematic um, in that it has a genetic bottle, bottleneck in overseas populations, which seems to indicate that it's come from somewhere else. Oh, which 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 Beautiful. kind of comes back to uh, who knows? Maybe they're they're part of the Siberian ISO complex. Thanks, Kane. I look forward to your PhD. Um, how wide is the potential scope for using psilocybin to treat disorders other than depression and PTSD? What are the implications of the exclusion of people with certain health conditions, such as schizophrenia and bipolar? Simon? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think there's enormous scope to treat disorders outside of those two. Um, and like I said before, I think there's probably enormous scope for using it as a, a, a wellness um, improver and maintainer. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of similarity between the psilocybin experience and um, Therapy, like psychotherapy as well. So I think there's a potential for psilocybin to be engaged in a similar way to those processes. Um, in terms of the implications of the exclusions, um, at the moment I think that that's actually quite a, a sensible idea. Um, we know that people. feedback coming through quite badly. Um, we know that people with a predisposition to psychotic disorders are at a much greater risk of having a psychotic relapse under the um, circumstances of, of any sort of substance use uh, across the board largely. Um, and we know that the implications for those individuals of having a relapse can be lifelong. Um, you don't always recover to the same level of cognitive functioning that you went into an episode with. Um, and that means every episode has the potential to significantly alter the course of that person's life for the rest of their life in a, a negative way. Um, given that we can't predict who that's going to happen to, we can't predict how bad that is going to happen to them. Um, and we certainly wouldn't expect psilocybin to have a significant therapeutic effect on their psychotic symptoms uh, or, or in the, the case of bipolar, when I say psychosis, I'm referring to sort of manic type symptoms um, and bipolar being much more closely related to schizophrenia than it is to depression. Uh, those two should be considered uh, in, in a category together. Um, I think at this stage it's it's really reasonable that they are excluding those individuals and I think often even excluding people with first degree relatives who have those conditions because they're about tenfold more likely to develop those conditions as well. Um, I, I, I think it's best to play it safe um, and I 
uh, I think that's the only way we're going to get them through regulations and, and through ethics committees as well, especially at the moment. Look, that, that may change. And if you ask me the same question five or 10 years from now, I may have a very different response. Um, but I think the potential is huge. The sorts of conditions they can be used for are wide ranging, um, incredibly wide ranging. And I really think it can revolutionize the practice of psychiatry if used appropriately and potentially revolutionize the way we look at uh, psychological health and wellness in, in general, as well as our connection to each other and the environment and the way society functions. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think there's absolutely enormous possibility, but I think at this stage, those people with those uh, either existing psychotic conditions or a significant predisposition towards those psychotic conditions, uh, it, it's definitely better to be safe to sorry than sorry in, in those instances. Thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> on to the next question. How can you get a permit to post psilocybin mushroom specimens in Australia to overseas? I'm not sure if the overseas is, is it part of the question? I'm not sure. I think so. Um. Hmm. Or is part that a B. part B? Okay. Okay, cool. So just in Australia, how do we get the permit to do it in Australia? Emma. Um, so it's a bit of a problem because while we have a permit to um, collect wild fungi um, for herbarium specimens, um, in order to actually hold on to um, psilocybe, mushrooms you you need a schedule nine um lab and to get a schedule nine lab you have to do all kinds of crazy security stuff and you have to pay like twelve hundred dollars just for the application and that doesn't mean that you'll necessarily get approved and um yeah so it's pretty much it's not really it's not really possible at the moment to get a permit to send psilocybin mushrooms in Australia, especially not for individuals. Um, I think maybe you'd have to be part of an organisation, probably a university. And in terms of sending them overseas, um, I, I don't think you can get a permit to do that. It's international drug trafficking. It's what it's considered under law. I just would not do it. And you don't need to do it. Uh, just to speak to that briefly uh yeah to send let's say for example the united states you need to have a dea license to be able to import specimens psilocybin specimens into the united states so yeah that does become drug trafficking at that point um and yeah just to kind of mirror what emma says uh you would have to be probably in an academic position uh and you would have to negotiate a relationship probably between the police and the um, health services of your respective states uh, to be able to have permissions to be able to work with, with Schedule 9 compounds. And hence the mushroom. Cool. Thanks, Kane. Um, how can the audience support research of you, the panellists. We'll go through everyone again, starting with you, Darklight. I'm muting. Um, I think research and development for small private businesses um, is something that's not pushed as an option. I don't know if it's because we're becoming more anti-science and our public outlook and people don't realise that innovation isn't necessarily expensive. Um, it seemed to be out of reach. But it used to be a lot easier to get um, talking to people at universities and places about small projects. That's kind of gone by the wayside with the increase in commercialisation of, um, of facilities. I think the best way to support um, risk Research is to ask for it to happen, whether you ask a small business or you ask your elected representative, you ask your teacher, you, you just keep asking good questions. That makes good research, good paid research is what supports us. 
we'd like to say a bit more of that. Do it any way you can. Um, Emma, how can people how can people help you? Um, well, yeah, get in touch with us because if, if you're interested in this stuff, we you know we want to we want to encourage everybody to to be doing this to the best of their capabilities. So just get in touch and work out you know how you can work with us or how we can help you set up a project. Um, for example, we have you know someone who who got involved with the wild fungi project who has now set up her own citizen science DNA um, thing in um, Rockhampton. Um, and, you know, we can work together and, and share information and, and you know, yeah, just support each other. Thanks. Does anyone else want to add how people can help them? Bo? Uh, yeah, just, um, yeah, it'd be good. I, I don't really uh, have anything to, um, I'm available for uh, talks, workshops and other sorts of fungi education generally uh, if people are interested. That's about the only way that I get support and I make the money to do what I do. Um, yeah, and that, that, that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thanks. Simon? Uh, yeah, please write your local MPs in your state and your federal MPs and every MP you can get a hold of and talk to them about the importance of changing the regulations around psilocybin mushrooms. Um, and also just to plug Unharm, the organisation are doing community conversations at the moment. If you Google Unharm community conversations, um, sign up, come along. We're just talking to people from the community about their experience um, of, of drug policy. You don't have to have, had, have actual experience of using drugs. If you do, fine. If you don't, that's still cool. We want to just talk to everyone and um, see how we can move forward with um, trying to push for changes in drug policy in Australia. Thanks, Simon. Um, Kane? Um, I would just suggest help the organisations that you really feel strongly in. Uh, if you really appreciate the things that my community do, just get in contact with us and we can work something out. Um, I know NGA are, and PRISM have a donation section to their website. Um, there's... and. For example, we don't have a project like this in Australia at the moment. It'd be nice to kind of work something out. Uh, but with the Entheome Foundation that I'm involved with, we're looking at having um, people donate to, to get psilocybin sequenced. So um, it would be great to be able to do something like that here. But I mean, yeah, we do have restrictions here with the Schedule 9 permits, for example. Um, but the, yeah, it's happening overseas. So it'd be nice to marry those things here. Um, but yeah, support EGA. <laughs> EGA does good mm -hmm. things. <laughs> yeah, and EGA um, is, has released or is releasing the tic more tickets for garden states at the end of the year really soon. So that would be a fantastic way to support all of this research and all the scientists. Um, I haven't got any more questions coming up. So that might be it this evening. Um, I'll say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Kane, Emma, Simon, Darklight and Bo. It's been lovely. Thanks, thanks for helping and answering and educating. It's been great. Thanks heaps. Thank you, Jess. And thank you, Jess. Thank you, EGA. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you, EGA. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, EGA. And thank you very much to all of our panellists this evening um, who have been our fungi foragers uh, talking to us about uh, the science, about conservation efforts, uh, and uh, sharing with you some resources as well. Uh, in the chat, we'll have some uh, some of the links, but remember, again, uh, some of the best places to go is just head to the uh, EGA website. 
entheogenesis.org forward slash resources and you can download that PDF resource uh, right there. Um, Entheogenesis, uh, if you don't know, is a charitable educational organisation. It was established in 2004, so coming up on 20 years, uh, providing opportunities for critical thinking and knowledge sharing on ethnobotanical plants, fungi, nature and sustainability uh, through conferences, workshops, uh, aiming to celebrate the culture, art, politics and community around medicine plants in order to further the well-being of humankind and the planet. And... The best way to do that is come along to the in-person event uh, Friday the 3rd till Sunday the 5th of December 2021 uh, with a number of guests. Tickets will be on sale on Monday, uh, so make sure to get along to that. And you can do all of that at the Entheogenesis website, entheogenesis.org. Sign up for the newsletter uh, there and then you'll receive updates on everything, including our upcoming webcast, which will be announced uh, in the coming uh, days. And then we'll have that information for you. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. My name is Nick. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I don't know why you'd want to. I don't post. Uh, um, I post all sorts of things there. But if you're on Twitter, um, find me. I'd love to have more ethnobotanical uh, conversations uh, on there. And there's many other forums as well that you can discuss these things on. Some of them that have been mentioned tonight. Uh, Facebook groups, although I'd urge caution. I wanted to grab a bunch of pictures tonight of some of the um, the the uh, the many Instagram accounts, uh, which seem to be vendor accounts, which are popping up trying to add me as a friend every day. Uh, uh, get involved with conversations instead on places like Facebook, but also on Discord, also on the Shroomery, which has been around for uh, decades now, providing information. Um, and of course, Erawid. Erawid.org is always a good place of information. Uh, if you want to keep up to date on psychedelic science locally, prism.org.au is the place to go. Prism is P R I S M. That's psychedelic research in science and medicine. And of course, again, Entheogenesis Australis. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much to uh, everyone uh, for coming along tonight and supporting us. And good night.